Hello, my name is Aidan Sullivan. I'm Vice President of Photo Assignment for Getty Images. Thank you for joining us today. Behind every image, there's a story. Whether that story is told by a Getty Images photographer, filmmaker, or editor, one constant remains, the passion we share for all types of imagery. For the next podcast in our ongoing series, co-founder and chief executive officer at Getty Images, Jonathan Klein, talks with award-winning photojournalist, Uriel Sinai. Uriel joined Getty Images in 2003 and is based in Tel Aviv, Israel. As an award-winning photojournalist, Uriel's approach to a situation is both studied and impartial, as he's determined to try and tell both sides of the story. This determination often puts him in dangerous, life-threatening situations while covering issues such as the Israel-Gaza conflict, the war in South Ossetia, and the violence that flared up during the Kenyan elections. Uriel's powerful images have been widely recognized by many organizations, including World Press Photo, National Press Photographers Association, the China International Press Photo Contest, and most recently, from the Picture of the Year International Contest, where Uriel was recognized as the Magazine Photographer of the Year. Many people have seen Uriel's images on publications around the globe, and today, for the the first time, you will get to hear the stories behind them. Firstly, Uriel, I want to thank you for taking the time to do this interview with me. It's uh, the highlight of my day. Thank you, Jonathan. When did you join Getty Images? Why did you choose such a strange career? Just a couple of, of uh, background questions just to get us started. Well, I joined Getty Images in 2003, and uh, I, I started taking pictures when I was 15, and then I started I started taking pictures for newspapers when I was about 17. I used to go with a camera to school, and that's how I began my career. And did you have formal training to get as, as technically strong as you are? No, never. I never went to school for photography. I was, I was trained by wedding photographers at the beginning. I was actually <laughs> shooting video. <laughs> you have a natural eye, clearly. and. Uh, I guess growing up in Israel, it's not entirely surprising that you have had a lot of experience covering uh, conflict. Yeah, I've, I've been covering the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for, uh, I think, 13 or 14 years now. Some of the most spectacular and arresting images that you have taken was a different part of the story, and that's really Israelis fighting with Israelis in, in Gaza when the, when the settlers were moved out of Gaza. Did that feel different? Yeah, it did feel different because I, I lived there for a few months and I got uh, a bit of connection with the people, that, and you feel the same suffering. And then, of course, the Gaza story continued into 2008. Were you able to cover that? It wasn't so easy. The Israeli army was just not letting anyone getting anywhere near the Israeli soldiers or the border. What I had to do is to rent a pickup truck and pose as a farmer. <laughs> Whenever you have soldiers going around or something is happening, you could jump off your truck and take some pictures and, until somebody will come around and point a gun at you and, and kick you out. I'm looking at, at an image from an Israeli funeral for a Hamas rocket victim. And do you get... Um, numb or is everyone still the meaningful? Last thing, the last thing you can you can you can become in a funeral is numb. Right. Uh, it's just impossible. So you said that that's one of the hardest things you have to do is is photographing funerals. Yes, you're there, you're clicking, you make noise, you, you have to move around, you have to sometimes be in a spot where a family member wants to stand mm. and, and be grieving and you're taking his spot because you need to be there and take pictures and you need to explain to these people that it's important for the world to see. Well, let's have a look at some of those images from Georgia. It must have been pretty strange for you to be parachuted, if you like, into this part of the world and to try and cover both sides of what was a complex story. You couldn't really cover both sides. It was mainly covering the Georgian side and whatever the Russians would let you cover. From, from my feeling, it felt like uh, the Russians targeted journalists, so journalists would not be in the area. Well, of course, I remember very well at the time and that the Russians had stated that they had withdrawn, and it was actually the journalists and the photojournalists who actually produced evidence that they hadn't. I think you've got an image of a young uh, soldier looking out of a vehicle which was taken in Georgia after the Russians claimed that they'd w withdrawn. Yeah, they, 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 were, they were Russians all over the place. They called themselves peace, peacekeepers. Did you have an interpreter? I, I'm sure you needed some help. No, I, I did not have an interpreter. I just had a driver and a colleague that I was uh, going around with. 
And uh, I usually don't like going around with interpreters. I mean, uh, when you go around with, with a bunch of people, it's always more people and, and, and more attention. What is the key skill to be a good conflict photographer? You must have a good eye, and then you have to be very fast and a little bit of predicting what's going to happen next. You want to know what, what's going to be the next move that the guy in front of you is going to do, and then you want to be waiting there for him to do it. At what point in time do you say, no, no photo is worth me getting terribly hurt or worse? This happens. It happened to me once in, in Congo. In some situations, you just realize that it's just not worth it and you're not going to be leaving this place alive and you better hold your camera and, and go back home. Uh, you mentioned Congo. How did you actually get this close to General Nkunda? And was he cooperative? Oh, General Nkunda, he's, he is very cooperative. He, he, he's a very intelligent person. He's uh, very aware of the uh, media and how it can help him. And uh, actually, he was inviting journalists his, uh, to, to come and see him because he'd rather have his picture in, the, in newspapers and magazines of pe pictures of people suffering. The way you've, you've photographed over there is it's very rich. You've used the colors. I mean, um, I'm looking at an image of a soldier with a machete with a very strong uh, background of the foliage. Are you very conscious at all times that you're also trying to create a great photo? First of all, with these soldiers, the first thing you, you deal with is your safety. Yeah. Is, uh, he was pointing the machete at me. The second thing is the photo, of course. Yeah. You, you're there, you want to get the photo, and you want to... You want other people in other places to see it. Is that why you do your job at the end of the day? What I do is take pictures and I know how to tell stories and, and that's why I'm a photographer eventually. I want somebody waking up in New York or London to wake up, have his coffee and maybe I could move him just a bit. Do you think about awards when you're working? It's not my main goal every time I go for an assignment, but it's there. I know that if I take photos and it wins awards, I can take more photos. No, I think that, that's very wise. That's very wise indeed. I can see why you won the very prestigious magazine Photographer of the Year Award, because we were talking about Georgia a moment ago, and then you, you also went to Kenya. I jumped on a plane and I got to Kenya. The same day, uh, the riots began again. It was, there was a first week of riots and then a second week of riots. And the second week of riot just uh, started when I arrived. Uh, I checked into a hotel and ra went straight away to the, to the slums where the riots were going on. But you appear to have got extremely close. I'm looking at a photo of a man lying on the ground with his hands up. Um, tell us a bit about that. You seem to be right in the middle of that. These soldiers were uh, stoned. And, and, and what happened is that this guy just moved around. He was a drunk man. He moved around, they let him go, and then once he moved past them, he pulled up his shirt and he had a giant machete knife on his back. Oh. So this guy just, just got him and beat the hell out of him. What do you think you'd be doing if you weren't being a photojournalist? I, I don't think I would be doing anything else. I think maybe I would, be, uh, I, I would open a restaurant. I mean, the, other, the only other thing I can do is cook. So. Well, I can certainly eat, so. <laughs> but, I, but having said that, I would far rather you continue to do what you're doing and the restaurant can wait. We're proud and we're humbled, all of us, I speak on behalf of all of Getty Images, to have you on our team and to have you as a colleague. And I do not for one second underestimate the ingenuity, the skill, the talent, the bravery, the hard work that goes into each of these images which is showing us in our safe places around the world what's happening in other places. So I'm just you know, enormously grateful for everything you do day in, day out. And as I said, I'm not the only one who's proud to be your colleague. And thanks so much for taking the time to have a chat today. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm really proud of being part of Getting Images and being able to work for a company that lets me be or in all these places and, and, and try and tell these stories. Thank you very much. You're most welcome.